All right, how's it going, guys? I'm Alex, and today I'm here with Logan. We're going to be talking about nub formations in relation to how they're running the NFL today and some of the concepts that NFL teams could use that are uh, being run in the college game and all the wrinkles off the nub looks that teams are running and will continue to run in the future. So in this first one, we got the nub look to the boundary. We got the receiver side to the field. And overall, the Packers use this a lot with their uh, outside zone run game to just create an easy RPO look if they weren't matching up three over three on the receiver side. And if they were getting three over three on the receiver side, they were getting a hat in the hat in a run game. So it was very effective for them in that regards. So in this first clip, they're lining up two, DB, two DBs over the three wide receivers. So Rodgers knows right at the snap that he's just going to be able to throw this really quick to Adams and he's going to have two on two blocking and pick up a short gain here. The, uh, like I said before, they're blocking outside zone. So everybody's zone stepping to the left. Everybody's blocking their covered defender. If they don't have a covered defender, they're climbing to the second level. Yeah, and with that being said on the outside zone idea, so they're leaving that uh, backside edge defender unblocked. So they're not even going to block the defender closest to Devontae Adams, who ends up catching the ball here. So the only way for the Bucks to really defend this numbers-wise is to have a linebacker leave the box. Um, obviously, that's not very ideal in the run game. So if, if they did line up three over three, they, they wouldn't have him leaving the box. But the fact that you're going to try to have a linebacker leave the box and catch Devontae Adams from behind is, is an interesting strategy. He ends up getting there, but, I mean, it's a little bit late after, you know, a seven-yard gain, and this is about as easy as it gets for the reigning MVP. So on this play, you know, same game, actually. The Packers ran this a lot against the Bucks in this game. Uh, they have the nub to the boundary side once again, three receivers to the field. Uh, except this time the Bucks have matched them. So uh, they saw that screen earlier from Devontae Adams, and they realized that's a bit too easy for uh, Rodgers and Adams. So they've actually decided to man up on, on the receiver side. So due to them having three receiver, three DBs over the three receivers, as well as a single high safety, uh, you have five offensive linemen and a tight end who are trying to block the seven guys in the box. So you have a six versus seven hat count, but due to them running outside zone and not blocking that backside edge player, it really becomes six blockers blocking six guys. Now, usually when you have the equal hat count or even maybe plus one in the run game, you should gash them for a pretty big gain which is really what happens here. Everybody's zone steps to the right. Uh, running back makes a good cut uh, and explodes through the hole. Now it is A.J. Dillon, who probably is slower than I am. Uh, so although those quads are huge, they're not very useful. And uh, he does get tracked down from behind, but not after about a 20-yard gain. All right, yeah, so on this play against, uh, against the Lions, the Packers once again are in that nub look to the boundary, receivers to the field. Uh, this is going to be the exact same play that they ran against the Bucks with a little bit of window dressing. So they have the motion here from the wide receiver, which is an easy man or zone tell. So because the defensive back carries with the motion, you know it's man coverage. With it being man coverage, uh, you kind of take away that really quick screen that they like to throw. But with that being said, you also equate the numbers in the run game. So they still have six blockers on six defenders, uh, and they're not blocking that backside edge player because it is outside zone. Uh, although it does, doesn't get blocked extremely well, they block it just well enough uh, so where they can have Aaron Jones kind of skirt through the, through the hole a little bit and, and end up getting into the end zone. Just a great example of getting hat on a hat and uh, blocking the numbers game just, just as they're taught pretty much. Yeah, like you said with the window dressing, they, well, Florida does a good job here with um, just using different personnel packages to get to it and like the motion to get to it because you just can't key on it with like 11 personnel. They could be in the nub look there. They got two backs on the field. I believe that's Tyler Irvin. And with the pre-snap read with the corner following him uh, to the left and back, he knows he's just going to have the run read because he's following him all the way through once he flares back. And also, like you said, even though it wasn't blocked the best by the right tackle, the center and the left guard do a good job of widening the point of attack and letting Jones just – get through. So in this next clip, this is one of the ones that, uh, one of the wrinkles that the Packers ran this season off their nub look with the majority of it being outside zone, but here they're running a pin and pull concept, which is very similar to their outside zone concepts where they're trying to hit the edge. And um, another constant with this is they're leaving the backside defender 
unblocked. So if they get a three over three to the field with the receiver side, they're going to have a hat on the hat in a run game. And just it's good numbers for them play side. So here with this visual, you have the backside defenders down blocking the left tackle going up to the linebacker, the left guard on the backside defensive end. The center with the second polar, he'll be the um, the climber. And the, the right guard will be the kick out block on the edge with the right tackle and the tight end down blocking on the play side defenders for them to get to the edge. This is just another way the Packers kind of get their six, for, six versus six hat count. So although they could run outside zone here, uh, it's a little bit more advantageous to pull two guys to get them to the point of attack, uh, especially when you have an all pro center like Corey Lindsley, it makes it a little bit easier. Um, you know, and with that being said, it doesn't matter how you get the six on six, as long as you get those numbers blocked up and, and create that crease to the back, you know, things are going to go pretty well. And although they don't hand it off here on this play, uh, we'll kind of go through the play now. Uh, Devonte Adams ends up getting this on the pat on the screen pass, but due to the fact that you know he's coming in motion, nobody bumps over. You see, it's not man coverage, and you know when they've shown that it's not man coverage in the past, the Packers are more than willing to take their easy screen completion and and take their eight yards and and go to the next play. Don't know if this pin and pull would have been blocked up too well. Uh, it looks like it kind of gets clogged up here, but uh, that also takes into account they have an extra defender there because they're not playing in the run game. Uh, you know, and with that being said, this is a very easy completion for Rodgers and Adams, uh, and they'll take it all day if they can. Yeah, like I mentioned in the last one, Kendricks isn't even, like, putting himself in a position where he's playing halfway. He's 100% fitting this run, so the second he gets this snap, he knows he's throwing it. Makes it super easy as well, considering you don't even have to block the edge player. Like, you can just let him come in, and if you know you're throwing it right away, you, don't even, you aren't even fearful of being hit at that point. So on this next one, we're kind of sticking with the outside zone family tree here with Shanahan. And here he is also running pin and pull to the boundary, but this time he has a little window dressing in regards to the personnel. They're in uh, 22 personnel with Kittle and Hughes check out wide. And um, Mostert, I don't know who that other tight end is, on the end of the line of scrimmage with Debo as the number three motioning to the backfield and flaring out where he originally came from, which is just great offensive architecture. Either way, but here everyone flares out to Debo. So they got three on three to the field, which means they should have numbers in the run game, which they're able to pick up a nice gain off of it because of that. So here, once again, we got, I believe, the right guard and the right tackle pulling. So the right tackle kick out. The guard also helps the right tackle seal his kickoff. Center has a nice reach, and it's just Mostert one one with the corner. And if you have outside corners as the only free defender trying to tackle your back, you're in a pretty good position to get yards. I mean, the 49ers don't even block up this play correctly. Like they have a great read on it. They they do have the correct run read. As you can see, there's two defenders to the field side who play that return motion pretty pretty heavily. They're not even concerned with the run. So when they hand this off, they actually do have a six versus six box count. So they should block it up correctly, including the corner. But the right guard and right tackle decide they want to double somebody else, and nobody climbs to the corner. So, I mean, even when they blocked it incorrectly, this is such, a, such an easy play for them to hand it off and, and kind of go back to their bread and butter outside zone family idea that – you know, even when you're not blocking six versus six correctly, if you're forcing a corner to tackle a running back, you really just hope your running back wins at that point. And although he does fall forward, I know you'd like to, you know, see him break that tackle and maybe score here. But if your running back's not getting touched until he's five, six yards downfield, that's an easy win for the offense. And it's just it's a great display of play calling here by Kyle Shanahan. Okay, so this time we got Kansas City running it this year. We focused on the the outside zone heavy teams this year, but this time we got the Chiefs, and here they got the same middle field look, and they're going to send Nicole Hardman in orbit motion or ghost motion, whatever you call it, make it look like jet motion, and then he's coming back across the formation. And right when Mahomes looks at Hardman to pump fake it, he's got three defenders static looking at the, the screen coming back to the trip side. He's got 41, 55, and 23 frozen right here. And then on the top of the screen, we got Kelsey on a release route on this defensive end who they're really setting up the screen for. 
and this defensive end's pursuing the running back coming across the formation. And it's just really good play design because it just leaves multiple defenders looking in the wrong place. And once again, static defenders with the offense getting an opportunity to get the playmaker, their playmaker, the ball in his hands, a lot of space. I mean, they call Andy Reid the king of screens, and, and they have a reason to. I mean, there is so much window dressing on this play. I, I feel really bad. Well, first of all, I feel bad if you're on the Houston Texans roster now, but I'd absolutely hate to be a Texans linebacker on this play. You got the motion for number three to deal with. You know, maybe they throw that orbit screen. Then you have the back who's already leaking to the flats who Mahomes opens up to. Then you got to worry about that. And then all of a sudden you get the ball to, you know, just just a four-time all-pro tight end and Travis Kelsey and who's, you know, running with three blockers in front of him. Like, this is just such a great play design by Andy Reid. And the amount of space he gets his guys on screen plays is just insane. And then it's kind of up to them to do their work. But this is just a prime example of how, you know, that nub look forces the defense into something that is very predictable. It's the same exact middle of the field closed look we've seen all day. And, and they can kind of exploit it just, just by using window dressing and motion and things of that nature. Uh, defense just, just have, are forced to become very predictable when you line up in this formation. And, you know, if you're predictable against a guy like Reed, a guy, guy like Kyle Shanahan, a guy like Matt LaFleur, like they're going to kill you. And that's, that's kind of, you know, how they've used that nub formation. And, and now we're going to look at some, some college guys, specifically Joe Moorhead, who absolutely loves this formation and this idea of using that nub tight end. And, and uh, we're going to kind of look at, you know, how he can involve the NFL game by using this. So like I said earlier, Joe Moorhead is now the offensive coordinator for the Oregon Ducks. And he had one year, although it was the COVID year, to really display how much he loves this nub formation. So this is just a really simple nub formation to the right, although they're in pistol, not gun. Uh, the idea is still the same. They still got the nub formation, and then they have three receivers to the field. Now, with the college hashes being a little bit wider, it's a bit easier of a tell. So this is going to be uh, a little bit different. As you can see, the middle of the field safety has to cheat over to the three receiver side a little bit more just due to where the hashes are, which then leaves seven defenders in the box and only six blockers. Well, the easiest way to help that equate numbers is to read the unblocked defender. So here they're going to run a simple read option. They're going to read the edge defender to the field and they're going to block the other six defenders with their six blockers. And anytime you can get a hat on the hat in the run game, it should be a big positive. They end up reading the edge defender. He stays home and plays the quarterback. So it's an easy give read for, for the running back to just simply hit the backside B gap and he's gone. Yeah. The, the interesting thing about the, the college game in particular is Sure, there's some guys who in the pros who can run this read stuff, but just having the ability to leave the backside end unblocked and with these pistol sets, not knowing maybe where the uh, the, the flow of the play is going, it just leaves the defense and just kind of a bind pre-snap where it's hard for them to just know it's coming. So this is actually the same game. This is going to be a two-point conversion attempt. So it's a little bit different for them here on this play. So they're running a pin and pull towards the boundary, towards the nub look, uh, while they still have the three receivers up top to the field. So what they're going to do here is they see the man coverage look uh, by having three defenders right over the three receivers to the field. So they're going to flare out their running back to the right side behind those receivers. What this does is this is going to pull a defender towards the running back, which then equates the numbers in the box. So you still have six blockers and in, in this case you have eight run defenders so obviously six versus eight is not too good but like I said the running back's going to be taking one guy so then it becomes a six on seven well it just happens to turn happens to be that the Sam linebacker also ends up going with the running back initially and has no choice but to try to pursue the quarterback from behind and he simply doesn't get there which then leads to an easy walk-in two-point conversion for the quarterback yeah, plays like this are just great offensive design when you have four guys flowing out to the field. And especially with QB runs in general, you're typically going to have numbers running play side. And it's just a great design in the red zone because just having a four-on-one to the field just puts the defense in such a bind. Okay, so this time we got another zero blitz look in the red zone. They're running the, uh, the nub to the boundary. And rather than flaring out the back this time to get numbers, they're going to have the running back act as a lead blocker. And they're going to pull 52. So that way they can get a hat and a hat, play side seven on seven, 
and it's just an easy run for the quarterback because everybody's accounted for. The only guy that's really unaccounted for is seven, but he's completely out of the picture. He's not he's the backside defender. They're not worried about him. And it's just another way for offenses to have numbers in the run game, even when uh, they're showing a pressure look like this. Yeah, I mean, like we said earlier, the college ashes definitely play a role. I mean, they have three defenders over three receivers over there. And this isn't even really a read play. This is a designed quarterback sweep to the boundary. Um, and so with seven defenders in the box, if you have six offensive linemen, five offensive linemen, a tight end, who's on the line. So there's where you get your six. Plus a running back to go lead block for your quarterback. I mean, seven on seven box count. It should just be an easy walk-in touchdown. Uh, which it ends up being. And this is just another great play design by Joe Moorhead. This is actually uh, Trace McSorley who runs this in. So Joe Moorhead was the offensive coordinator for Penn State uh, during the Trace McSorley years. And he used this nub formation in the red zone religiously. It was incredibly efficient for him. And when you got a quarterback like Trace McSorley who can, you know, go and pick up those extra yards with his legs, makes it so much easier as a play designer. And Joe Moorhead really, really emphasized that in his, his old offenses with Penn State. So this is actually the same game, uh, same look, uh, except they're just going to flip the sides of the field. So now they have the boundary to the right, uh, which means they have the nub look to the boundary and the three receivers to the field. So USC actually changes their alignment here. They actually have an extra guy in the box. Uh, last play uh, on the goal line, they had their safety shaded over a little bit more to the three receiver side, but now he's kind of playing a pseudo linebacker position a little bit deeper, uh, but it doesn't end up mattering. So they run the exact same play, it seems, uh, so they still have seven guys to block, including the running back, and the running back's going to go lead block, but he's not going to lead block. He's actually going to slip that outside lead block, and he's just going to walk in, uh, ho hopefully for a receiving touchdown, which he ends up getting. Uh, only thing I would say about this play is, one, it's great play design, and two, there's about four illegal men downfield. I don't know how this play was not flagged, but I guess if it if it they don't call it and it ends up working, it's a good play design. So another good one from Joe Moorhead kind of playing off those tendencies that he already showed in the past. Yeah, this play really just puts the defenders in the bind, especially uh, I believe that's number 22, who's supposed to be taking on the lead blocker. He's thinking that he's just about to get popped and he's got to, you know, contain everything back inside for a QB lead. But instead, he just gets run right past him. He's ready to initiate contact. and He's just not ready for Barkley to run past them, and it's too easy. So here's a Joe Moorhead staple. They're running their nub to the boundary in the red zone and three receivers to the field side. So what they're gonna do here is what I like to call a run pass triple option. Uh, so this is something that Moorhead has run a lot in the past and it's, it's pretty unique. Uh, and it's definitely something I could see trickle into the NFL game. So they're gonna run a read option play initially, except the tight end in the nub position, number 88, is gonna leave his defender unblocked and that's the initial read key. Now, the tight end isn't going to climb to the second level and block. The tight end's actually going to run a corner route. So how this is going to work is their quarterback, Trace McSorley, is going to run the read option. And if his read is to give it, he's going to give it, and that, that'll be the end of the play. They'll run the ball. However, in this play, his give is actually a keep, give, uh, keep read. So he's going to fake the handoff and keep it, and then he's going to start running and boot. Well, the tight end runs the corner route, uh, the cornerback, number 10, has to respect it or he'll be wide open. The cornerback drops back with the tight end, uh, and then, then it just becomes another secondary read. So uh, if the corner stays home on the tight end, Trace McSorley's just going to run it in for a touchdown, which he ends up doing. Uh, but if that corner were to bite up and, and kind of play that read option run from the quarterback, it'd be a nice easy lob right over his head for a nice touchdown. And this is just, you know, like I said, I, I've been calling it a re run pass triple option because – uh, your first option is to hand it off to the back. Your second option is to run to the quarterback. And your third option is just to dink it over his head for a nice, easy touchdown. And I think this is something that we could absolutely see trickle into the game in the NFL. You know, teams like the 49ers with Lance could do this with Kittle as kind of that tight end read guy. Uh, you could absolutely see this with Cam Newton and the New England, New England Patriots. Uh, there's just so many possibilities with quarterbacks starting to become more athletic that this, this type of triple option could become far more prevalent in the red zone. Yeah, and like you said, with the NFL stuff, a lot of the times where they're putting defenses in no-win positions, they're running a lot of these passing concepts to the field. But here, they're running it to the boundary, and I just think it's a nice wrinkle off everything else they've run so far. And just being able to make the defense wrong on the RPO side on the field and the boundary is just too much for defenses to defend. 
Yeah, Joe Moorhead's the absolute king of this. Yeah, I mean, like, you have two defenders that are both, you know, key defenders. One you're reading, the other one you're reading a little bit later in the secondary. But, I mean, Joe Moorhead is a great red zone study. I encourage you guys to, you know, look look at him uh, and kind of what he does in the red zone. And, you know, with that being said, there's there's some – things that he does that are not yet in the pro game that I would, I would bet will be in the pro game very soon. Uh, and he is just an absolute wizard down inside this 20 yard line. And with that being said, I appreciate you guys coming to watch our video today. Um, I look forward to seeing you guys next week. I think our next week videos is, is going to be about how deep threats affect coverage shells and, and how that affects the run game because, you know, drafting John Ross and, and Henry Ruggs early in that first round might seem like a bust to, most people, and, and although some of them have been bust, the, there is some logic behind how, how often it forces defenses into negating the run game a little bit. So that'll be a great video, and we look forward to seeing you guys next week.